Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents, and we are reading Psalms 32. No matter what's going on, you guys, we have to decide who we're going to trust. Where is your trust? Who do you trust? What do you trust? And what are you going to do about what you trust or who you trust? Listen to this. All right, Psalms 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my, bone, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. This is God speaking now. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord. Mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Let me repeat verse 10. That is the key scripture. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord. Mercy shall compass him about. My question to you is, where is your trust? Where have you placed it? Are you trusting in Trump? Are you trusting in Biden? Are you trusting in the Democrats? Are you trusting in the Republicans? Are you trusting in the vaccines? I'm going to share this with you. Number one, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a lie. You have to determine where you're going to put your trust. See, here is the thing. You can be like the third world countries who have no choice. There are villages out there that have no choice. They have no other water source. The government is not providing. And they are walking miles with these buckets on their head to get stagnant water filled with larvae and everything else that you can think of, all kind of contaminants, bacteria. That is their only source of water. They have no idea there's water right under them in the earth unless some organization comes and drills holes and pulls up and builds wells and they have clean water source. But if they don't get that kind of help, their only resource is that nasty water. And they're dying like flies because of all the different illnesses that hit them because of it. Well, my this is my analogy to you. The same way those people are going to those nasty water sources is the same way that many of you will go right into your slaughter as the government lies to you and promises you all kind of goodies, all kind of healing, all kind of benefits. Come unto me, come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Too many flies are coming into the devil's parlor. Too many of you are sitting in the enemy's camp, warming yourself by the devil's fire, living by the devil's lies, feeding off of the devil's poison, and you think it's okay because you see the benefits. You see a check coming to your account. You see money coming from here and money coming from there. But let me tell you, 
at what cost? The Bible says you can win the whole world. But if you lose your soul, at what cost? I mean, if I got to lose a job, if I got to lose my house, I still have God. God is my source. God is my provider. God is my supplier. God is my great physician, my healer, my buckler, the horn of my salvation. God is my hiding place. When you get to the point where you trust all that you see, all that you hear, all you can touch, all you can get your hands on, before you trust in our invisible God, guess what? You're just like those people that are feeding off of that horrible water. And then you wonder why you're always getting sick. Listen, we're living in the last of the last days. And we've got to be very, very careful about who we listen to, who we take advice from. What does the Bible say? God says, I will instruct you in the way you should go. Don't be hard-headed. You, you see that verse? He said, don't be hard-headed. I'm going to read it to you because I want you to hear that's really what he said. Don't be hard-headed. Don't be mule-headed. Yeah, yeah, the kind has got to be dragged here and dragged there. Be ye not, verse 9, as the horse or as the mule. What is the characteristic of a mule? Huh? Stubborn, which have no understanding. See, God, he doesn't leave us ignorant. He teaches us. He opens our eyes. He uses the body of Christ to keep us abreast of everything that's going on. I'm going to tell you this. God will not stop you from taking the mark. God will not stop you from bowing to Baal. Who is Baal? Your job, your checkbook, the government, the vaccine, all of that is Baal. Listen, God's not going to stop you. Why? He gave us freedom of choice. He wants us to follow him out of love, not out of obligation, not out of constraint. Whatever we give to God, whatever we do for God, whatever we do with him, he wants it to be out of love and willingness, obedience. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. So you can sacrifice your money, you can sacrifice your car, you can sacrifice your rights. But that doesn't please God like obedience does. If God says no, then where are you getting ready to go? If God says stay home, what are you doing out there in the streets? What are you doing in all these doctor's offices, jumping from here to there? If God wants you to hide in your chamber until the plague be overpassed, then what are you doing? You're just ripping and running. Can't sit your little hiney down. You got ants in your pants and you need to dance. You can't be still. Can you? Why? Because God is not your trust. God is not your source. God is not your peace. Sit your behind down at the feet of Jesus and let him impart to you because you're going to need all you can get from him now. If you're not that heavy into hours and hours of prayer, give him a few minutes every couple of hours, but give him time. Get in that word. Teach yourself. See, I'm going to tell you. There are women out there. I'm, I'm going to paint a picture. And the picture of the women is society as a whole. There are women out there that will get so caught up and enamored by fine as wine in the summertime, stacked, built. Hung like a Shetland pony. Hey, baby, come on here. Listen, the man could be 
a serial killer. The man could be a gigolo. The man could be a good for nothing joker that wants to suck the life out of you. A narcissistic idiot that just wants somebody they can beat up on because it makes them feel like they're all that in the bag of chips because they got a little power, a little authority. Just to have you intimidated by them is a high. Listen, that is the same way. That is the picture I'm painting of society. Society would rather have a piece of man, hmm, a piece of God, a make-believe God, a mega God, a, a, um, I can't think of the word. But the bottom line is, you know, we'd rather have the fake thing because it's easily accessible. You can go to the store and find junk food everywhere you turn. But when you want to you want to feed your body with what it really needs, you got to fork up some more mighty dollar for that. You want organic, pay more. You want health and benefits, pay more. You want nutrition, pay more. You want junk food, cheap. You want liquor, cheap. You want all the things out there. The dope dealer will give you dope just to get you hooked. And then he reels you in and you're at his every beck and call. Right. Well, that's the way society is. They want us to depend on everything but God. They're the ones calling right, wrong. And we're supposed to say, yeah, yeah, that's right. If the government says that that's what it is, then yeah, that's what it is. Really? Yet the Bible says, let man be a, let God be true and every man a lie. But you're going to believe the lie because you want to be liked. You're going to be, believe the lie because you want to be in with the government's good graces. You want to believe the lie and live by a lie because you want all their benefits. You want the food stamps. You want the welfare. You want the unemployment. You want everything the government has to give. And the government is doing it at your expense. You don't realize it. Now, it's different if you're just getting some help. Everybody needs help. And that's fine. You paid your taxes. You deserve the help. There's no condemnation in that. But don't look at that as your source. God's the one that opens the door for them to help you or not. Not them. You may think they're the ones making the decisions. No, baby, it's God. It's God. Oh, my goodness. Okay. My point to you is you must trust him. You know how you trust him? And I told the story in the other video, just the previous video of how, or two videos ago, how I lost a job standing on God's principles. And, to, and a day later, got a phone call um, offering me a job that was way more hours and way more pay than the one that I lost. See, whatever you lose for God. God, Jesus even said, nobody has given up husband, wife, kids, house, family, land without me rewarding them for it. There is nothing that you can give up for God that he will not pay you double for your trouble. He will not reward you for it. Yeah, you may feel the sting for a minute, but it's not permanent. It's not permanent. My question to you is, who do you trust? Who do you trust? I remember when the Lord told me my husband was going to die. I saw a vision of my husband with a, a, a thing over his head. And I asked God, Lord, what's going on with Milton's head? Went downstairs. My baby had a headache. Looked at his eye. It was blood red. I knew he was hemorrhaging. Got him to the hospital. They put a death sentence on him. I went back to the Lord. Lord, what do I do? The Lord gives me a dream of Milton looking up at me apologetically saying, baby, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I knew Milton was ready to go. 
I knew God was letting me know. You notice none of his ailments are taking him out. This is something that's totally unexpected because it's his time. You wanted warning so you can get paperwork in order. Here's your time. Here's your time to say goodbye. 33 days. Milton stayed in that bedroom. And I promised him he did not want to go back to the hospital no matter what. I said, I will keep you at home. You don't have to worry about being stuck with needles and all kind of crap. I will keep you at home. I will not send you anywhere no matter what happens, if that's the way you want it. If you don't want me to pray for your healing, I won't. That's your body, not mine. No, I didn't get mad at God and blame him. The Lord showed me Milton was tired, tired of being sick and tired and sick and tired and sick and tired. God knows, baby. He always knows what's best. There are times when some of you get angry at God in this season of death during the holidays. A lot of people drop like flies. It ain't got nothing to do with COVID. People just die during the Christmas holidays for some reason. And there are a lot of people that stop walking with the Lord because somebody died. What you stop walking with the Lord for? Your loved one is with the Lord. Unless you don't know your word. Your loved one is with the Lord. You think they want to come back? You're crazy. Out of your mind. Why would you want them to come back to a sick body or live in a sick body? on and on and on so you can say they're with me that is selfish and heartless it's cruel a woman told me years ago about a relative that was laying in the hospital in a convalescent home and every time she went to visit her she would constantly have tears going to the back of her head why she wants to die and the family wrote something that said, whatever you have to do to keep her alive. She's being tortured, living in a body she wants to die from. And they'll do anything, artificial, uh, life support, whatever, but they won't let, they won't pull the plug, they won't let her die. Now, I know one day God's going to say, enough is enough, I'm going to take her home. But my question to you is why? Who are you trusting? Why do you want that loved one to stay in the sick body? In and out of the hospital, in and out, in and out, in and out. Surgery after surgery, pain after pain, torture after torture. Why would you want that? Why would you get angry at God for releasing them from that horrible life that they live in? Releasing them from that wrecked body of pain. Why would you get angry at God for that? What are you trusting in? What is it? Don't you know if God takes your mother, if God takes your father, if God takes your son, your daughter, your brother and sister, he can replace them with a God son, a God daughter, a God mama, a God papa. He can replace them. He puts the solitary in families, that's what the Bible says. You don't have to be alone. He'll assign people to be your friend. Listen, no matter what you're going through in this life, no matter what's going on, God is in control. Some of you are looking at a shell of a person that you love, laying up in that hospital, and you think that they're suffering. Youth, because they've got all these machines hooked up, their bodily functions are still going. Some of your loved ones have already flown the coop. They're with the Lord. Clinically, they're still alive. But spiritually, they're with the Lord. They've left that dead body. And the machines are keeping it going. You don't know they're gone. You don't know it. So you try to drag it out, drag it out, drag it out, drag it out. I don't, I don't know if you ever heard the testimony of this man that was run over, that was hit by a big rig. To this day, every time he gives his testimony, he always adds at the end of it. If you ever see me laying there dying, leave me alone and let me go. Don't force 
trust me to come back here and live out all that pain. Don't do that to me. I know where I'm going. We have to decide who we trust, who we trust our loved ones with. We trust them in God's hands or we're going to be the ones in control. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to be the HNIC in this picture, huh? You're going to run the show. Or you're going to trust God, trust them in God's hand. The day, listen to this, after eight years, wasn't eight years at the time. It was eight years of adultery. It was an adulterous marriage. After three years of it, of eating myself to oblivion, emotional eating, all kind of worries and fears, anxieties and feelings of betrayal and all kind of hurts. I got tired of carrying all that load. And I remembered that scripture that said, where Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, guess what? I went out in the backyard one night and I said, Lord, here is Kirk's adultery. Here are my insecurities. Here are my hurts. Here are my feelings. And I kept going like this. Here are my feelings of betrayal. I just kept offering it to the Lord. That was my offering to the Lord. I gave him my ashes. He gave me his beauty. Beauty for ashes. Isaiah 61. I offered him. I gave him my fears. I gave him. My, my, my insecurities, I already said that. I gave him my compulsive eating. I gave him my ex-husband at the time we were still married. Here's the husband. Here's the adultery. Here's all of it. You carry it. I'm tired. It's too much for me. That night, after I gave it all to God, the next morning I woke up, worries gone. Hurts, gone. Fears, gone. Insecurities, gone. He came home the next night, guilt written all over his face. I wasn't even tripping. I just looked and I said, okay, let me know if you need prayer. And it was as if somebody stepped in some, some mess outside in the sidewalk and they wiped it off. And I said, let me know if you need help. That's about the effect it had on me. None. None. From that point on, the last five years of our marriage, I was footloose and fancy free. My friend Eleanor and I would go shopping, go to church, go to different things, go to different conventions. I was living the life, y'all. Totally pain-free, knowing my husband was between the legs of a prostitute every other day running up the phone bill with 900 numbers, all kind of stuff. Why? My trust was in God, not my husband. My trust was in God. And God took the pain away. The Bible says death. Where is that sting? Huh? Grave. Where is that victory? Uh-huh. It's mocking it. Because when God gets in the picture, and you put God in the mix, there is no sting. Death has no victory. I don't care if it's a death of a relationship, if it's a death of a body, if it's a death of a family member, if it's a death of a circumstance, if it's a death of a dream. I don't care what the death is. It has no victory. It has no sting. It's like the toothless wonder. Can't do any harm. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Not when you use God as your covering, your hiding place, your shelter, your tower high, your tabernacle, your resting place, your refuge. God is all in all. All that you need is God. Amen? Put your trust in him. Blessed is the man that makes the Lord his trust.
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path.